Thank you for being here again this morning. We uh, continue our series about heaven called Amazing Place. And when you focus on the amazing place that heaven is, it makes your problems in life much smaller. I heard about a, a few preachers who were having an issue with birds getting inside the buildings up in the attic of their churches, and they were causing a lot of problems. One was a Presbyterian pastor, one was a Quaker, and one was a Baptist preacher, and they got together to discuss over lunch how they, how they were dealing with the bird problem. And the Presbyterian minister said, well, you know, we're Calvinist, and we believe those birds were predestined to be in the ceiling, and we don't want to interfere with the will of God. The Quaker said, well, we are pacifists, and we could never harm any of God's creatures, so we trapped the birds, and we humanely released them, but two days later, they just were back in the attic. The Baptist preacher had the best response, and, and he said, well, we trapped the birds, and I personally baptized them and put them on our church roll, and now we only see them at Christmas and Easter. There are many things missing in the church that ought to be there, not the least of which is the commitment and sometimes even the presence of the members. But I have to say, one of the things that I love about the church is that there are many things missing in the church that you find too much in the world. I find much more racism in the world than I find in the church. There is much more sexism in the world than I find in the church. There's a lot more materialism in the world than I find in the church. And when I look at the world religions, they are full of legalism. But when I look at the church of Jesus Christ, it is built on grace. And I think all of that prepares me for heaven because I want to suggest to you today that one of the best things about heaven are the things that are going to be missing. Think with me on this. What is heaven missing? Look with me at Revelation 21, the first four verses. John, the revelator, shares his vision and he says, Then... I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. <coughs> it's very clear that one of the greatest things about heaven is what will not be there. And I could not in one sermon begin to cover all of the things that won't be in heaven, but I picked some things that I think mean the most to me. And here's one of the first. Write this down. There will be no more inclination to rebel. Because one of the questions that I am asked a lot is how can we have assurance that when we get to heaven, we won't do what Adam and Eve did? How can we know that we won't do what Satan did? How do we know that, that we will stay in heaven forever? I'm suggesting today that all thoughts 
and all temptations to try to rebel against God are going to be missing from heaven. Let me give you some reasons. One is that the futility of rebelling against God is going to finally be exposed. God's total sovereignty over evil will be obvious for all to see. There is going to be a place, I don't know where, but a place we will be aware of called hell. Hell will be complete evidence of the futility of trying to overthrow God. And by the way, the Bible never mentions a throne in hell. Now you've seen that in cartoons, but you, you know who rules hell, right? God does. God is sovereign over hell. And hell brings glory to God because it testifies to the universe of the futility of thinking that you can sit on God's throne. And that will be there as a witness to us. You see, there will be the eternal sufficiency of Christ's atonement. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but it also says in 1 Peter that Christ died for sins once for all. That means he doesn't need to ever die again. Now, there, there is no death in heaven. And where there is sin, there is death. There's not going to be any sin in heaven or a need for Jesus to die. Also, there is the truth about sin made evident. Because we're going to know what Adam and Eve didn't know. We're going to know the cost and the consequence of disobeying God. Every time we see the scars in Jesus' hands and feet, we are going to remember how ugly sin is and what it does. Adam and Eve were duped by the devil. He told them, God is, is holding out on you, but we're going to know better. We are going to know that God doesn't keep anything good from his children. Also, there is going to be the incorruptibility of our new bodies. The Bible says that we are going to be raised incorruptible, not uncorrupted, but incorruptible. We are not going to be like Adam and Eve who were created in innocence. We have a, a superior position. We are going to be raised in the righteousness of Christ. And finally, there will be no evil in heaven. Satan is not going to be there to lie to us. Nothing ungodly is going to be a part of the mix. Look at verse 6 of Revelation 21. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What does that mean? It means the battle with evil is over, completely over. There is going to be a tree of life in heaven that we will all be able to eat from. Like, like there was in the garden, but nowhere in Revelation does it say that there's going to be a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you know why? Remember what Satan did? Eat of that tree and you could be like God. Well, in heaven, the issue of who is God will be decided forever. It is going to be forever known. He is God, and He alone can be God and should be God. And we are, we are not going to wrestle with that lie or have a temptation with that anymore. In heaven, there is going to be no inclination to rebel. And we have no idea how wonderful that is going to be. You see, in heaven, there is going to be no confrontation with evil. We've already suggested that evil will have no foothold in heaven or, or any leverage to affect us. That's what John meant when he said there was no sea there. 
The sea was where the beast came from in Revelation. And to the Hebrew, the sea was a, a scary place full of danger. And the idea is that in heaven, there is nothing that will be scary, nothing to fear. Look at verse 27 of Revelation 21. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. One of the questions the last several years that our government has wrestled with is this. How do you secure the borders of a great nation? How do you make all of the, the coastline and, and all of the borders of this country safe so that, so that no evil person with a malicious intent can, can slip into our country to try to hurt us? Well, you don't have to worry if God can protect the borders of the heavenly home. God says nothing evil will ever enter heaven. Well, what does that mean? You, you won't need padlocks in heaven. You won't need burglar alarms or security cameras, anything like that. There will not be policemen walking the streets. There will not be any suspicion of anyone of anything. There will not be anything to fear, nothing to hide. We will be rid of the influence of the demonic empire that is all around us now trying to always seduce us. We will be rid of the whole organized world system of men opposed to God. We are going to be rid of the flesh and of our own nature that does exactly what we don't want it to do. We will be rid of all of it. And I'm not going to miss one bit of it. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will finally get what you want. There will not be any more confrontation with evil. Also, there is going to be no more expectation of death. We can't even fathom what this is going to be like because death and, and the shadow of death is there like the moment that you're born everybody in this room is dying right now the evidence of death is not just in the cemetery or the frail stooped body of a very old person we see evidence of death every time we hear of another child born with a birth defect Every time we hear of another teenager that has leukemia, every time we hear of a grandparent diagnosed with Alzheimer's, we are reminded that the shadow of death is literally all around us. Dr. Joseph Huffman was a celebrated pianist and composer, and on his 80th birthday, a reporter asked him, Dr. Huffman, are you still composing? And he said, no, I am decomposing. And we all are. During the healing series that I preached several years ago, I told you when I was in my 20s, I, I could work physically all day long and, and I could just get up the next day and, and I could go. And, and then in, I, I hit my 30s and, and I could do physical work all day and the next day I would be really sore and now I'm, I'm in my upper 40s and I get up in the morning and I'm sore and I didn't even do anything the day before. The scientific term is entropy. It is the second law of thermodynamics. Everything in the universe is deteriorating. The shadow of death is on everything. That is the only life we have ever known. We can't even imagine a life outside of the shadow of death. How do we know that heaven will not be like that? Well, one answer, Revelation 22, verse 3, there will no longer be any curse. The curse will be lifted and we have no idea what it's like to live without a thought 
of death. No decay. No deterioration. No sickness. No reminders of mortality. And I'm telling you, I won't miss one bit of it. I'll tell you something else that is going to be unique about heaven. There will be no more occupation with time. One of the great old songs that we sing says, When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. I hate to ruin that song, but it isn't going to be true. We will have time in heaven. I used to think just the opposite before I, I studied this thoroughly. The reason that I know there will be time in heaven is because time is simply a, a measure of a sequence of events. And in heaven, you are going to know we're doing this now and we're going to do this after we've done that. And if you didn't have time, you would not have music. And we already know that there is music in heaven. And it's not that there will be no time in heaven. It is that we will not live under the pressure of time. Anybody in this room ever feel pressure from time? I do. I'm, you know, maybe 40 minutes now into my message. And I say... For my second point, see, as I study and I prepare a sermon each week, and, and I put a lot of effort and a lot of time into, into putting a, a message together, the first thing that I think about on my way home from church on Sunday morning is, I have to start to get ready for next Sunday. Sunday is always coming in seven days. It always does. It doesn't matter if I have a wedding or if I have a funeral. Sunday is still coming. I don't know about you, but almost every single night when I go to bed, I feel, I feel like I cheated either my family or my friends or my job because I didn't have enough time. And on top of all that, time is constantly reminding me that things I love have an end. That, that party that you're having a good time at, it's going to end. That great year that you're going through is going to end. That person you are married to and love so much someday... That's going to end. Time is always reminding me that every good thing in my life has an end. But it's not going to be like that forever. You see, Scripture says in Revelation 22, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of a sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. In heaven, time will not be a diminishing resource. John Newton had it right. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. I don't know about you, but I am in a hurry to get to a place where I will never have to be in a hurry again. Another great thing about heaven is this. There will be no more frustration in obedience. One of the most frustrating things about fallenness is that I am unable, and I am aware of this, I'm aware of my inability to give God all that he is due. I know why. I don't give God everything that he deserves, partly because I've got a, a self that I am trying to die to every single day, and it keeps coming back like some bad episode of The Walking Dead. I've got a sin nature that is constantly getting me to do what I don't want to do and not do what I ought to do. But on top of that, I deal with shame. 
when it comes to my inadequacy. And I think I ought to do that for God, but I'm not worthy. I'm just too sinful. And on top of all of that, there's just this frailty of my mortality. My body is getting weaker. The, the day is going to come when I am not going to think like I am able to think or work like I am able to work. I don't want to be like Brett Favre. Athletes are always playing too long. They're, they're always thinking they still got it when they don't. I don't want to do that. When I ain't got it anymore, just let me know. I ain't got it anymore. Some of you have been letting me know, but I'm, I'm talking about the great majority of you. When I haven't got it anymore, you should let me know I haven't got it anymore. The fact of the matter is, since the day that I was born, I have never given God all that he was due. But I am going to get a new body that is never going to grow weak. I'm going to get a new nature that will never be morally flawed. Someday my heart will only love purely and my mind will only think nobly and my tongue will only speak graciously and my hands will only serve gladly. You see, Revelation 22 says in the latter part of verse 3, the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. And I want you to imagine this. Imagine never passing your peak. You will not be a static being in heaven. You will grow, and we're going to talk more about that, but, I imag but just imagine you, you serve God and you never pass your peak, ever. All the limitations of this life that, that kept you from serving God like you wanted to serve Him are, are gone. Look forward. I, I, I can't wait. I look forward to giving God what He's been missing. My absolute, total, unfettered dedication. One last thing. There will be no more separation from God. This, to me, is the best part. It says in Revelation 21, verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. What will be missing in heaven is distance from God. God will no longer have to veil His face. We will be able to see Him in all His glory and stand in His holy presence. Look at verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. You say, well, why is that important? Do you remember, do you remember the Old Testament temple? It had this elaborate system of, of divisions. It, it designated how close a, a person was able to actually get to God. There was, there was the court for the Gentiles, and they could not go past that court. Beyond that was a court for women, and beyond that was a court for men, and beyond that was the court for the priest, and beyond that was a, a holy of holies, a place that only one priest could go in one day a year. And it was all laid out. This is how close you can get to God, and don't you dare try to come any closer than that. And John says there's not going to be any temple in heaven because of the blood of Jesus and the access that he created. We are all going to be able to live in the holy presence of God. There are not going to be any barriers to God in heaven. And you know what? We are never going to get enough of God. It won't happen. It is His embrace that we have been missing most of all. Max Lucado writes, The old saint tells us when we get home, God Himself will wipe away our tears. 
He said, when I was a young man, I had plenty of people to wipe away my tears. I had two big sisters who put me under their wings. I had a dozen or so aunts and uncles. I had a mother who worked nights as a nurse and days as a mother, exercising both professions with tenderness. I even had a brother, three years my elder, who felt sorry for me occasionally. But when I think about someone wiping away my tears, I think about my dad. His hands were calloused and tough. His fingers were short and stubby. And when my father wiped away a tear, he seemed to wipe it away forever. There was something in his touch that took away more than a drop of hurt from my cheek. It also took away my fear. Now John says, someday God will wipe away your tears. The same hands that stretched the heavens will touch your cheek. The same hands that, that formed the mountains will caress your face. The same hands that, that curled in agony as the Roman spike cut through will someday cup your face and brush away your tears forever. And when I think of a world where there will be never a reason to cry again, doesn't that make you just want to go home? Why would anybody want to miss heaven? But they will. Because there is one thing heaven misses most of all. Maybe you have not thought about this. But one thing heaven misses most of all is the reason some people won't go to heaven. Do you know what it is? It's pride. You can be sure. No human pride will be in heaven. That is our problem. Pride is what got Satan kicked out of heaven. And that is the same thing that will keep people from entering heaven. If the presence of God is the best thing about heaven, the absence of pride will be a very close second. We cannot fathom that. We can't fathom living in a world without pride. But I say to you, your first conscious thought in heaven will be, only He is worthy. And your second will be, amazing grace. That was John's final thought when, when he wrapped up his picture of, of heaven and when the Holy Spirit wraps up the Bible, the last word is Revelation 22, verse 21. The grace of the Lord Jesus will be with God's people. Amen. Do you know what heaven is? Heaven is grace uninhibited. Heaven is grace unending. Dear friends, please, I beg of you, don't miss heaven. We're going to sing a song of invitation, and if you have a decision to make this morning, why don't you stand up as we get ready to sing?